Yeah, hello Andrew, it's really good to see you. Thank you ever so much for joining us today. And maybe as a to start, be. you could introduce yourself, um, where you're from and what you're doing. Sure, uh, it's good to see you, welcome uh, to myself. Hello to everybody. Uh, my name is Andrew Nevins. Uh, I am an infectious diseases doctor at Stanford. Uh, and uh, I am part of the Center for Immersive and Simulation-Based Learning at Stanford, where I'm the medical director of the Standardized Patient Program. Yeah, that's how we met, because I went there to see how you are running things, and it was in February this year, and frankly, the world was kind of a different one then, and so much has changed, and we're really interested in hearing how you are running the teaching at Stanford now with the COVID-19 um, situation. But maybe first, you could tell us a little bit in a nutshell how studies work at your place, how many students you have, and how things are run. Sure. Uh, so I'm, I'm aware that things are a little different here in uh, in the United States than they are in Germany. Um, so we are a uh, a private uh, medical school in California associated with Stanford University. Uh, we actually have a pretty small class. We have anywhere between 90 and 100 students, which uh, is pretty small. Mm -hmm. And so um, you are mainly responsible for the part where standardized patients play a role in teaching. Um, so how do you use standardized patients in your normal regular teaching? So let's start still before COVID-19 started. Um, we use standardized patients throughout the school curriculum. We have formative exercises for the early learners where they're learning how to take a history, how to do a physical exam, and just start putting the pieces together in a clinical encounter. Um, so those, exam those uh, exercises are mostly um, just to make sure that you're doing it correctly for students to get practice. Um, we have a number of OSCE type exercises later on in the, in the curriculum. Um, we have some postgraduate programs uh, for students who have already graduated who are pursuing additional training. Um, and we have a series of standardized patient-based exams that we call clinical performance exams um, throughout the medical school curriculum as well, where it's more of an assessment where we look at uh, how students are performing in a number of different areas, history taking, physical exam, um, what they counsel patients about, overall communication skills, and their clinical reasoning. Uh, so we use them throughout uh, medical school uh, in a number of different ways, depending on the level of the learner. Mm -hmm. um, and if I remember correctly, you even use them not only in the assessment situations like, okay, here's a station with an SP that you have to work your way through, but they are also really grading and assessing the students themselves. Is that correct? Yes, that is very true. We have a pretty rigorous uh, training program for our standardized patients, again, depending on the exercise. Um, but they go through a, a, a lot of training. We have a great team as part of our standardized patient program here um, that really is, is responsible for um, casting and training. They go through a very rigorous process for this. Um, and in particular, um, about assessing communication skills um, which is something that is uh, particularly valuable with standardized patient work. So I, I'm, I'm very um, proud of the work that our team does uh, to prepare standardized patients for access. Hmm. So how many people do you have as standardized patients? How big is the program? Boy, um, well, our, uh, my, I, I, I first have to give a shout out to the director of the standardized patient program, Karen Thompson Hall. Um, who really is responsible for everything about our program. Uh, I'm the medical director. She's the director. So she uh, is really responsible for the entire program. And we have two fabulous um, trainers as part of our program as well, Eli and Chris. So hello to everyone. Um, we have um, anywhere from, I believe, 100 to 200 standardized patients here that are actively enrolled in our program. We're pretty fortunate here in the Bay Area of California, we have a wonderful pool of very talented and dedicated um, actors 
um, who really value this work and really um, put a lot of energy and work and practice into making sure that they're really portraying what we want to portray and assessing what we want to assess. And it's everyone together who really um, makes our program so special. Hmm. That sounds really amazing. And uh, I think it was particularly helpful now in this semester. And I'm pretty curious how you manage this whole pandemic thing, like with the digitalization of teaching, or maybe you do teach in person, I have no idea. So maybe you can tell us a little what happened when it became clear that particularly California was pretty stricken by um, COVID-19. So maybe you can talk us through this phase and what you decided how to change things and adapt them. Yeah, you know, and, and, Ca and California is still in the midst of of a lot of the, the, unfortunately, a lot of the numbers, a lot of the volume here in the United States. Um, so, you know, it, 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 it's interesting because it came on pretty quickly. Um, between the time that the, the virus started, it was declared a pandemic, and then it felt kind of all of a sudden uh, things happened. So we had to adjust very quickly. Um, and, you know, I, I always like to say where there's crisis, there's opportunity. And so, sure, dealing with a crisis, trying to figure out the best mechanisms to really do things, um, what's going to be most appropriate. It also has given us a real opportunity to think, hopefully, you know, think a little creatively. What can we really do? And we're, we're kind of at a stage now where if it can be done remotely, uh, it will be done remotely. But we also want to balance that with in-person um experiences because nothing really replaces being in the same room with people and, and really uh, reading body language and understanding uh, with eye contact a little more easily uh, in person um, to really understand what students are thinking and really to teach them. So it's a, it's a fine balance that we're really trying to strike right now. Okay, so when you're saying right now, does that mean that from the beginning you had also in-person teaching? So you kept small group teaching or was there a phase where you were really not, because that's how it was here. We had a start of the semester and we were told that no one is allowed to do teaching in person. Everything has to be uh, digitalized and if it can't be digitalized, then it can't be taught at the moment. So did you from the beginning start with in-person teaching as well or how... When the, the, the pandemic started, when the, when the real crisis hit, uh, everything was remote. We converted everything from in-person to everything being uh, on camera, uh, digitalized, uh, remote. So everything was remote, large group, small group, everything. Uh, so no one was coming into campus. No one was doing anything live. And now that we're planning for the next academic year, that's the hybrid approach where we're trying to figure out what can be done remotely and what really needs to be done in person. And again, it's striking this, this balance between um, what's going to be most effective as well as um, what the learners are going to get the most out of. And I think this is a very difficult question, isn't it? Because there are some things, as you said, that can be taught quite easily, like a lecture. I mean, it's still, at least for me as a lecturer, it's much nicer to be in a room physically with the audience. But still, I think content-wise, it can be replaced one-to-one. -one. Whereas there are, as you said, skills that I can actually only learn when I'm really there. So how did you manage to transfer those teaching units or what were your experiences when you started to teach communication skills or physical examination skills or procedural skills to your students remotely? That is kind of a tough question. Uh, not in a bad way, but it's tough because everyone does things slightly differently in a way. Um, we didn't really know, I don't think anyone really knew exactly how to plan for what happened. We're living through an unprecedented time um, where, whereby we have to figure this out and we had to figure it out pretty quickly. Um, so, uh, you know, we, for an early learner where we're just starting to learn how to take histories, how to do physical exams, some of it, we had to just try to educate, um, by camera without doing something in person, which was really a challenge, um, to do. But I think what, what it has done, again, there's an opportunity for us to really think about what are we doing? Uh, and so um, it, it's kind of, to me, underscored that 
you know, underscored the importance of simulation that, you know, we don't know exactly the extent to which simulation is going to continue to, um, to be of importance, especially with remote learners. But I think it's pretty clear that simulation is really important, especially in these times uh, where we have to um, be mindful of not only an individual student, but the, pub the public health um, at large um, in the era of this pandemic. So it's a tough question to answer, but we're, we've been really trying to strike this balance again of what can be done in person and what can be done remotely. Um, I have a little more experience, obviously, with the standardized patient world, um, but at least from a digital teaching, you know, versus coming in live, we're, we're planning on this hybrid approach whereby if we're teaching, if it can't be done virtually, we will be doing it virtually. So if we're learning, just learning um, uh, how to take components of a history, that might be something we would do remotely versus if we're trying to teach something else, we might have to find a way to be live and we're still figuring it out. Um, it's, it's a challenge, but it's also an opportunity for us again, to really think creatively and think about what we really want to be doing. And I guess partially, cause that was our experience. Um, there are things to learn that will be needed in future anyway. So with all the telemedicine going on, it was quite helpful for the students when we did teaching in the virtual world that they had to face problems like, okay, where do I look? Do I look at the camera, but then I don't see the face of my counterpart? Or do I look at the face, but then for the other person, it seems as if I was looking somewhere else. And this is something that, interestingly, my colleagues at work experienced with their telemedicine consultations with the patients. Um, and so I think that maybe, as you say, there are opportunities to learn new things and face new challenges or obstacles that can be helpful for later clinical work as well. Yeah, couldn't agree more with you. And it's so interesting. Um, Telehealth is here to stay. Um, it, it, it's it's something that we are we are all needing to learn, and we pretty quickly. Um, it had started to come a little bit here, uh, but once this happened, it just came on, and here it is. And this is now part of medicine. I don't think telemedicine is going anywhere, and learning how to communicate in person is one thing. Learning how to communicate using telehealth, where again, you're talking about, where do I look even? How do I, um, how do I show my interest? How do I really pay attention to someone? How do I uh, express empathy and really an understanding of what's going on? It's not the same thing. And so um, we are, um, you know, we're really having to learn like, what is our telemedicine curriculum? What can we take out of this? And this is definitely one of those things, communicating in person, versus communicating remotely. Um, coupled with that, you know, I always tell students like, when we learn clinical reasoning, and when we learn how to communicate with people, it's a different type of learning. You know, oftentimes throughout high school or college, uh, we're used to take, students are used to taking tests whereby there's an answer. You, you learn material, you study it, and there's a test. It's either option A, B, C, D, or E, and there's an answer. And you have to pick the right answer, and you have to score a certain percentage and get the answer. And medicine is very different than that. Clinical reasoning is very different than that. It's not so much learning how to get the answer. It's about learning um, how to, how to, what's the process? How do we go through the clinical reasoning process and built in with that? It's a different mode of learning. And then built in with that is how we, how we communicate, um, whether that be in person and now via telemedicine. Uh, so it's a, it's a, there are many different prongs to this and it's really interesting to be a part of it. And I think standardized patient work really has a big role in training students not only the clinical reasoning process and how to communicate in person, but also how to communicate remotely. Did you get feedback from your standardized patients, how they experienced the new teaching situation? Good question. Um, we are getting feedback from our standardized patients, uh, for sure. Um, feedback, as just in general, feedback from standardized patients to students 
in terms of how they do what their communication style is like is so critical anyway. We, we really like, we really value the standardized patient's feedback to students on how they communicate. Um, and now that we're communicating remotely for a lot of things, there is a, a real opportunity to harness some standardized patient feedback for learners about what their experiences are when you're getting medicine done remotely. Um, we're still generating feedback from standardized patients about uh, their experiences doing encounters remotely as well. Uh, we have a, a big um, um, clinical performance exam coming up next month, uh, which we can talk about in a little bit. Um, uh, but we're going to get a lot of information there, from, especially from the standardized patients about their experiences. And I think that will carry us forward in our telemedicine curriculum for sure. Hmm, that will be highly interesting. And you already mentioned, because that was a teaching bit, but we do have an exam bit. And I know that when you told me for the first time that you were actually performing your OSCE quite soon, I was stunned, um, but I'm surprised. So maybe you can uh, tell a little more about how you're planning it, how it will look like, and what precautions you had to go through now that we're still, and you said it, California is still in the midst of it. So um, what you have to do to make it possible that it's allowed to do such an exam at this time? Yeah, it's, it's been really interesting to be part of this process. One thing about these exams, I, I, I want to mention before I talk about the format of our, of our exam, one of the things that is, that's important with what the work that we do in the standardized patient program is about uh, teaching physical examination skills. Is there a virtual reality program that uh, we can use to a degree where um, you know we can have students wear something remotely that simulates a human body? It's it's really hard to think about. Um, so and this is part of the the challenge as we're thinking about our standardized patient exam, the clinical performance exam, is we usually have physical examination assessment as a real important part of this. And can we do that? Have we taught uh, the learners who are going to take this exam how to do things remotely, um, how to do a physical exam remotely? It's a big area of interest. And um, it's fascinating because when we welcome our new group of learners in a couple of months when they start our first year students, how do we teach them physical exam skills? We're still figuring that out. Um, so having an exam for um, a, a, a student who's going to be graduating where we ordinarily will assess their physical examination skills that they've already learned, can we do that in an era where we're not doing things in person and how do we do it? Um, that's been a real um challenge for us. And again, this is kind of what I was talking about before, that there's a crisis that we can't do it in person, but it does give us an opportunity to really reflect on what is our exam? What are we trying to assess? What's the best mode to do it? And so it's been really a very interesting process. Yeah, it sounds like that. And please keep me in the loop because I'm really interested how you will proceed. And I guess that's the question we are all asking at the moment. I mean, our OSCE exams have been postponed from August to October. So we have a little bit more room, um, but no one knows how the autumn will look like. But let's hope that everything will be OK and we can actually do the OSCE then. Um, but this is the really interesting question, isn't it? To say uh, when, when we can't teach like we usually teach, we actually can't exam like we <laughs> usually exam. And that's exactly what we're dealing with. That's exactly the point mm. um, of what we're thinking about now. Um, for a group of learners, this is a, a, this exam that we're running is for students who have already been through the majority of the medical school curriculum. And so we're trying to assess them now, but they haven't. we haven't taught them in the same way, probably as in the future, the telemedicine aspect of things, doing things remotely. And again, that that is the real challenge we at Stanford, um, we're part of a nine school uh, consortium. Uh, it's called the California Consortium for the Assessment of Clinical Competence, or CCACC. We sometimes just call it the consortium. Um, but we all run the same exam throughout the state of California. And the schools run it at different times. Some schools uh, plan to run the, oh, they were planning on running the exam in March or April. And we ordinarily are one of the last schools to run the exam in July. 
But our colleague schools who were planning on running their clinical performance exam in March, when this first hit, bam, could not run the exam. And so that's a whole different level of stress, really. Um, we at least had the opportunity that we knew our exam was in a couple of months. And so even though we have to cast and train much before the exam, we, we had a little bit of leeway compared to some of our sister schools. So at least I felt good about that. <laughs> so a bit of notice in advance, so to say. Um, yeah. And, and, and uh, you know, the, really the, the physical exam component, what we were talking about before, is really the, the key. And I guess this kind of flexibility is what is needed um, to adapt the teaching and the assessment of our medical students. So um, maybe two more questions that I'm interested in. One is, um, if there was one thing you wanted to tell students here from what you've learned, what would that be? Students who are now starting medical school and medical training, I think you're, you're more savvy than, than I am with, uh, with a lot of aspects of things related to doing things remotely already. Um, um, smartphones, digital devices, um, gaming, uh, you're already ahead of the curve. So, so uh, I, I think you're in a good position uh, already. Um, and, you know, I think really, I guess I would say, yes, we want to teach what we wanted. We still need to teach about the clinical reasoning and how to be a medical provider. Uh, at the same time, a lot of the things that um, this uh, that COVID has has taught us is there are some things that are here to stay. Uh, and I think telehealth, uh, telemedicine is a great example of that, where we are going to owe it to you to prepare you for a career in which you can not only see patients and, and think about patients when you're in person with them, but also remotely. And it's a different type of training that, that, um, that is needed. And so we're thinking about it, we're on it. And I think that, that early learners, um, are really going to be helpful to us as educators about what is effective. Uh, and so we're, we're, we're going to be counting on the next generation of medical students and medical learners to really inform some of the curriculum. Mm, that's a really good point. Thank you. Um, and I know that we met as experts in medical education, but still you do have your background in infectious diseases. So um, <laughs> may I ask, what's your personal opinion? What do you think? How are things going to proceed? How will they develop? Are we through yet or is there a second wave to be expected what's your and i mean it's just i guess as good as any <laughs> probably a bit more <laughs> educated because you have the background but i'm not going to phone you and say but you told differently <laughs> so just as a guess what would you say yeah um you know it, it's interesting uh, we like i said before we are living through an, uh, an unprecedented time of late and it's it's pretty, it's remarkable. So I don't know, like, I, I don't know if I can say necessarily that we're going to see a second wave. Some even say we're not out of a first wave, that it's just all the same wave in a way. I kind of think about it as it, it more so like as an infectious diseases provider, what has COVID done? What have I really, what, what have I taken away in a way, or what am I taking away from the COVID experience. And I think there's a number of things. Um, one um, is the importance of public health, not just personal health. This is something that we're all experiencing. So a lot of, a lot of people focus in medical training on the health of a patient. And that's very important. This really underscores the health of the public and uh, about uh, infectious diseases in general and, and epidemiology and public health. So that's definitely one thing, uh, the importance of public health. Uh, a second thing that I'm fascinated by is the rapidity, the speed in which things have been evolving. Um, clinical trials looking at antivirals and other therapies for COVID, vaccine development, collaboration is really remarkably quick in today's day and age. 
um, it, it's it's pretty it's interesting to see how quickly things are evolving. Um, uh, you know, and and as a as a backdrop to all of this, it, it has underscored for me um, that I you know I'm a little biased, obviously. I think infectious diseases providers, we, infectious diseases in general is critical um, to medicine and to public health. You know, it, 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 it's, it's interesting that it used to be thought when, when penicillin came out, when antibiotics were developed and vaccines come out, there were people that said, oh, infectious diseases is a dead field. We aren't going to need infectious diseases providers because we've conquered infections. And I think it's pretty obvious that that has not been the case. Uh, resistant bacteria, new outbreaks of, of viruses and other uh, infectious diseases globally. Um, so I think my field, um, infectious disease, I think is pretty critical. And to be honest, I have never been prouder to be an infectious diseases provider than I am right now. Um, I love my field and, and it's, a, it's a fascinating field. And so um, it's an ever evolving field that keeps us thinking about a lot of things. Um, so I'm really excited about, in a way, the future of the field. And as you said, it's really important to see that things can change quite rapidly and that we have to be flexible and even get used to situations where we, even as experts, can't say this is right or wrong, that's the truth or that isn't, because there's new knowledge every second, it feels like every second. And uh, yeah. so, um, at least for me, it was for the first time a situation where I really very often had no answer, not even an idea, not just rough guess, nothing. It was like your guess is as good as mine, so I don't know. And I think that's quite an experience, particularly for medical students as well, um, where sometimes there's this um, notion of, um, I have to know everything when I'm a medical doctor, and so it's quite a good exercise to see that um, there's still so much where we have no idea or where we have to learn day by day what it really means. So, um, yeah, I guess quite a challenge. That's interesting point. I don't want to... Uh well, very interesting point, which is, you know, oftentimes there's this pressure for students to think, uh, to, 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 to think, I have to get the answer. I have to know exactly what's going on. And it's true. A lot of the times you can see someone in a limited time encounter or in general, you can see someone and say, oh, I know what's going on. This sounds like X, Y, Z. I can explain that to you. But learning how to say, I don't know is a skill. And, you know, you're not going to say, Oh, I don't know. I'm where I, you, you, here's what I'm thinking about. I don't, I, I don't know. Here's what I'm thinking about. And here's what I'd like to do, but we'll figure it out. I don't know the answer right now. We will figure it out. And as you're getting at, especially with, with COVID, what, what do I do? And the answer is, I don't know. Uh, it, and it's evolving, or it has evolved and is evolving so quickly uh, that kind of, again, underscores that communication style, or communication technique. I don't know. Here's what I know. Here's what I'm thinking about. Here's what I want to do. Uh, and we will figure this out. Hmm. Yeah, I love to call it the competency to be incompetent sometimes. So um, that's <laughs> something students uh, and doctors have to learn and practice. And uh, yeah, I, I guess it's a, a good uh, finish line to say communication is quite crucial. You and I, we both love to teach communication skills. And um, I think that this crisis has shown how important it is not only to be the medical expert, but also how to communicate the knowledge we have in a way that other people do understand it in the right way. So thank you ever so much, Andrew. It was lovely to chat with you. And um, let's um, stay in touch so that I can learn how your exams went. And um, yeah, you said you wanted to visit at one point when it's allowed to travel again. So you're more than welcome <laughs> to visit Tübingen. It's a really nice town and um, a great university. And um, yeah, thank you. I, I will take you up on that. So yeah. No worries. <laughs>